Good evening, everyone. It's good to see the church so well filled tonight, and can I welcome you to the service here in Cumber Free Presbyterian Church tonight. It's good to see so many here in the building, and I welcome you uh, if you're at home watching online or elsewhere. Uh, we are glad that you're joining with us online for this service as well this evening. And we're going to begin with singing of a hymn, number 67 in the book, Take the Name of Jesus With You, Child of Sorrow and of Woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then where'er you go. Hymn number 67, and we're going to stand while we sing this hymn together now, please. Stand. Let's look to the Lord at this, the outset of our meeting tonight, and look to him for his help and for his blessing as we meet around the name of Christ tonight. Let's pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we come into thy holy presence now, and we come by that precious name, by that name which gives those of us here tonight who are believers, that gives us hope. It is the hope of earth. We confess tonight and we acknowledge tonight that we are a people who need hope. A people who, left to ourselves, have none. Because of our sin, because of the law of a holy God which stands broken tonight, we would have no means of approach to Almighty God. We would have no right, no ability to come before the thrice holy God of heaven. But tonight, praise God, we come in the name of Jesus Christ. We come by that new and living way, standing on redemption ground. It's not with the works of our hands that we can have that access. It's not because of something that any mere man has done, but it is because of the person 
because of the cross work of the God-man by which we come. And tonight we pray that everything we do would point our attention to Jesus Christ. That as those Greeks asked uh, that when Christ entered into Jerusalem, our prayer is like theirs. We would see Jesus. May we see him tonight. May we get that view of Christ that each one of us needs. That we have varying needs in the congregation tonight. No doubt many here are believers. Many here are in Christ. And yet tonight we confess. Each of us can. That perhaps the, the coldness that has come upon us. The, perhaps that lack of devotion to Christ that we once had. Has maybe slipped tonight as we come into the house of God. Some tonight perhaps need a word of comfort and encouragement. Others a word of rebuke. That need is met in the same per person. It's met in Jesus Christ tonight. Others still have a different need altogether. Others tonight are still in that place where they have no hope. Where they yet have no salvation. They stand on their own merit, which is no merit at all. They stand in need of a remedy. In need of deliverance. And tonight as Christ is preached. His gospel is presented. May that need be very clearly seen. But not only the need seen. But the resolution also seen. Make me faithful tonight. To present the gospel clearly. To hold no aspect of it back tonight. To hold back no part of the consequences of sin tonight. May it all be laid perfectly open. Perfectly clear tonight. And to those who perhaps have heard that message. Time and time again. Not by the ability or skill or wisdom of man. But by the Holy Spirit. May it be made effectual tonight. May tonight be the night that that message gets through. Not just to a head understanding. But to a heart understanding tonight. May it make that journey. In the ear. And down into the heart. Take away this heart of stone. Tonight, by the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit, give that heart of flesh softness tonight. We pray for uh, not just this service here in Cumber, but in like services all over this province, all over this world tonight, where the people of God are met, where the word of God is opened. May they have that same experience, that same visitation by the omnipresent God who can be with us all at once and can bless us all at once. Do it, we pray. Bless the people of God. We remember those tonight from this congregation who would regularly be here. In times past would have always been in the house of God, but through sickness, ill health, or other circumstances, they cannot be here. If they're listening in tonight, comfort them through the word tonight. Meet that need of a lonely heart tonight through the preaching of the gospel the presentation of Christ we pray tonight that whatever takes place that this service will be used to edify the people of God and will be used at the appointment of sovereign God to save the souls of the unsaved we pray and acknowledge tonight that in it all most importantly, that Christ will be magnified, the Lord will be glorified, and that we will be thankful tonight, filled with thankfulness at the exaltation of our great God. Do it, we pray. Solemnize our hearts. May we approach all the aspects of this worship service with a seriousness tonight, an appreciation for the, the gravity of what we are doing, that we are not observing ritual tonight but that we are in the presence of the one true and living God. And so may we worship tonight with earnest hearts, in spirit and in truth, with a deliberateness about all that we say, all that we do. Bring that solemnity by the Holy Spirit, we pray. We ask it all in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Let's turn in the Word of God at this point for our reading to the book of 1 Thessalonians. 
1 Thessalonians, and we will read uh, from the first verse down to the end of that first chapter, 10 verses in all. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we'll read now from verse 1. Let's read the word of God. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, under the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us From the wrath to come. And you keep a marker in that place. We'll turn back to that passage later in the service and consider some thoughts from it. But at this point, I'm going to ask Mr. Jackie Allister if he'll come and make the announcements to you all, please. Thank you. Well, again this evening, it is good to see you uh, in the Lord's house, and we welcome all who have been able to join with us uh, once again, uh, and we do pray that the Lord will meet with us and bless us. A special word of welcome, of course, uh, to our speaker this evening, uh, Mr. Glenn Hamilton, uh, one of our Whitfield College students, Uh, and like this morning, he has been uh, called upon at fairly short notice. Uh, because, of course, Mr. David McCauley, who had been announced to preach today, has gone down uh, with COVID. We do appreciate our brother standing in at short notice. We welcome him uh, warmly uh, to the pulpit here in Cumber today. I do remember the meetings uh, during the week, uh, Tuesday evening at 8 o'clock, our prayer meeting, time of Bible study. And as have we have been saying over the last couple of weeks, a few weeks, uh, that will be followed by a meeting of communicant members. Uh, so we've mentioned that a few times. I went into a bit more detail to, this morning. Uh, so do keep that meeting in mind, please. Uh, then on Friday at 10 p.m., uh, there is the men's prayer meeting as normal. Uh, Saturday morning, uh, this is for the Youth Fellowship. Uh, I think you know all about it. You're heading off for a day out uh, to Dublin Zoo. Uh, but just to emphasize the need to get uh, here to the church car park in good time, uh, I know that uh, they want to get away sharp at 8 a.m., so do keep that in mind for Saturday morning. Then next Lord's Day, the service is as normal, the Sunday school and Bible class at quarter past 10, the two services half past 11 and 7 p.m. Uh, as we mentioned this morning, we will be having A special speaker in the morning, Uh, Reverend Martin will be here as well, but the speaker will be uh, the Reverend Reggie Cranston, Uh, so do keep that in mind. And then in the evening time, our own minister, the Reverend Martin, uh, will be the preacher. It is the second uh, Lord's Day of the month, so we will be taking up our missionary offering next Lord's Day, and that will be going towards the work 
of the Missionary Council of her denomination. Again, young adults, if you keep in mind that the normal monthly meeting for young adults around the different congregations in this area uh, will be taking place next Lord's Day after the evening service, 8, 8.45, and the venue this month is our Carrie Duff congregation. So 8.45 young adults uh, next week over there in Carrie Duff. And then as we mentioned this morning, our seniors meeting is coming up again, the monthly meeting we have for seniors like myself, uh, and uh, that will be on Friday the 13th of May. Uh, not a very propitious date, mind you, maybe Friday the 13th, there might be some soup, soup spilled or something like that at the lunch afterwards. But uh, we'll be meeting at 11.30 a.m. The speaker this month will be Mr. Lloyd Watson, uh, and as we said, we do have lunch afterwards. Uh, and if you could just add your name to the list in the uh, porch of the church, if you're able to attend, and that helps with the numbers for catering. Thank you very much indeed. I'm thankful for the words of welcome. And it is uh, unexpected to be here this evening. I went to bed last night not thinking I would be here tonight, but uh, my experience of college life, especially since COVID started, you do have to be prepared for anything. This isn't the first time I've been called upon at very short notice. Uh, not always COVID. Sometimes people, uh, their wives have children unexpectedly a little bit uh, earlier than they were expected. That's happened. Sometimes it's a virus, but you do have to be ready for anything. And so uh, I don't, um, I don't, think that I have gotten away with it until I'm sitting in the pew in my own church on a Sunday morning because you just never know what's going to happen or your phone's going to go off and you're called upon to preach. But I'm very glad to be here uh, for the first time. I've never preached in Comber before to have the opportunity to be with you here and to preach in the service tonight. So thank you very much for the words of welcome. We're going to sing another hymn, number 203. I was sinking deep in sin, sinking to rise no more, Overwhelmed by guilt within, mercy I did implore. Then the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. Christ my Saviour lifted me, now safe am I. And we're going to stand again to sing this hymn number 203, please.
Turn it back, uh, back again, please, to 1 Thessalonians, where we read earlier, and open your Bibles up to that uh, chapter. And with your Bible open, let's quickly look to the Lord again before we preach the word. Eternal God, we are thankful tonight that it is the Word of God which we have in front of us. It's a living Word. It is not uh, some book of mere history, not some book of men's ideas, but it is the God-breathed inspired and infallible word. Tonight, may we look at what's in front of us and might we appreciate that that is what we're looking at tonight. That what we see in front of us is absolutely true. It's absolutely right. And it speaks right to our very hearts. And so may it be preached in that fashion tonight, and may it be carried by the Spirit of God to each listener, we pray. For Jesus' name we ask for help and for blessing. Amen. Amen. This week in our house, we had a sickness come into the family. It wasn't COVID, but it was something that uh, has been around for much longer than that. It was the dreaded chicken pox that arrived in our house this week. And it has, as you might expect, upset the apple cart a little bit in our home, especially for our four-year-old daughter, Holly. Uh, Like most children, I'm pretty sure, I've been reminded this week that she really does not like taking medicine, and I'm sure she is not the only one in that camp. Whether it's a spoonful of medicine in her mouth or some cream that needs to be put on her skin, it is always a battle to try and get her to take the medicine. But the hardest of all, the hardest of all medicines that uh, we have to give our children is definitely when it comes time to get the injections. Those are so much worse than any other medicine. And the reason I think that injections are the worst for kids is, is because they're given an injection to stop them from getting sick rather than medicine that they take when they are sick, when they're feeling sick, when they know that they need to take something. They can't understand, why would I want to have this needle stuck into my arm, especially because I don't need medicine, because I don't feel sick today. Why are you doing this to me? Why have you taken me to this cruel doctor who's going to put this needle into my arm? It's hard for them to appreciate that it's a good thing when, in that moment, they don't realize what it is that that injection is going to protect them from. That is something that is very hard to explain to children. But even as an adult tonight, because I appreciate it's not just children who are scared of injections, adults are scared of injections too. And perhaps if you're one of those people, you might think to yourself if you're at the doctors, is this really worth it? Am I going to see the benefit of what is in this injection? Because I don't really feel sick right now. I don't have any illness right now that I need to be healed of in this moment. Sometimes I think the gospel can be a little bit like that injection. Because to someone who's never been exposed to the Bible before, this good news of Jesus, this good news of what he has done at the cross to overcome sin, and to overcome death, it might not mean very much to that person. If we think of the gospel as the remedy for sin, and that is what it is, the remedy for the sickness of sin, then you can appreciate it's hard to understand the benefit of that remedy if you don't first understand the seriousness of that sickness. It's like going in for surgery. If you've ever had an operation before, you might know that you would never agree to go and get an operation, uh, to lie on the surgeon's table and go under the knife unless you were absolutely certain that you had a problem that you needed fixing. If you weren't really sure or if uh, there was a bit of uncertainty, you might not go onto the surgeon's table. Well, in the same way, the gospel is only good news if we understand the bad news first. And with that idea in mind, we're going to read again verse 10 
of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, which is the verse we're going to be concentrating on tonight, the 10th verse, and it says, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Of course, the gospel is good news. I wouldn't be the right person to stand in this pulpit tonight if I didn't think that the gospel was good news. But we have to understand the gospel is good news tonight for two reasons. There's two uh, ways of looking at the gospel, and in both ways, it's good news. The gospel is good news because of what Christ delivers the sinner from. That's the first. The gospel is also good news because of what Christ gives to the sinner instead. Both of those are true. The good news of the gospel has both what Christ delivers the sinner from and what Christ gives the sinner instead. And tonight, we're going to focus on the first of those things. What Christ delivers the sinner from. We're explaining the extent of the problem, but then the effectiveness of the remedy. And as we show tonight what Christ delivers the sinner from, we're going to look at it from this verse 10, although we're actually going to do it in reverse order. We're going to start at the end of the verse and work our way through to the beginning because the verse is written out of order. I'm not saying that the verse was written wrong, of course it's not, but it's out of chronological order. You see, it starts by speaking about the return of Christ. And then in the middle, it goes back in time and it speaks about the resurrection of Christ. And then the end of the verse takes us back a little further and refers us to the cross. And so we're going to do them in the order that they happen tonight. We'll look at what Christ delivers the sinner from, beginning at the cross, then going to the tomb, and finishing with the return of Christ. And so you look with me at the last part of verse 10. It speaks of Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. This is the first kind of deliverance in the text. The first thing that Christ delivers his people from, it is deliverance from wrath. It's the first kind of deliverance, and it takes us to the cross. Because scripture is very clear that it's at the cross where this salvation from God's wrath comes from. We all must first understand tonight that Every person in this world needs to be delivered from the wrath of God. This deliverance, you see, it wouldn't, it wouldn't mean very much if I said you can be delivered from wrath if you didn't first see that you are under the wrath of God, that you need to be delivered from it. And so let me start by saying you can be in no doubt that all people deserve the wrath of God. Look with me at Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, and please do turn to that chapter because we're going to read a few verses from chapter 5 as well in a moment. But start with Romans chapter 4 and verse 15. Romans 4 verse 15, and we're, uh, as I said, we're thinking about the fact that everyone deserves the wrath of God, the righteous anger of God. Why? Well, look at Romans 4 verse 15. It says... The law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Now, there's a very important little truth that Paul is setting out there in Romans 4. He says that the law leads to wrath. God's righteous anger towards all people is because of his own law. Now, understand what I mean when I say that. It's not that God has deliberately contrived to make laws simply so that he has a reason to pour out his wrath on sinful men. No. What Paul is saying is that God has given us his law. He's given it in the scriptures. And the reason he's given it is so that it might be kept, so that it might be obeyed. That law, it expresses God's holiness, perfect holiness, and his desire is that his created people will be holy too. That they will obey that law. But it is through our own weakness. It's through our own rebellion against God 
that we have chosen to break that law. It's because of our own weakness. That's why we read in that verse 15, where no law is, there is no transgression. If God did not have a law, then there would be nothing for us to break. We couldn't transgress a law that does not exist. But God does have a law. He has given us his law and we have transgressed it. That just simply means we have broken it. We have broken his law and that is why the law leads to wrath. The law worketh wrath. Our deliberate failure to keep God's law, that is the reason for his righteous punishment. We need to be delivered from this wrath. Christ's people have been delivered from that wrath. Christ's people have peace with God. That's what peace with God is. It's deliverance from wrath. If you look over into chapter 5 of Romans and verse 1, look at that verse with me. It says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You notice that we have, the people of God that is, Christians tonight, we have peace with God. Why? Because it says in verse 1, we've been justified by faith. Justification brings peace with God. But what is justification? No point in me throwing that word out there tonight and assuming that everybody knows what I'm talking about. What is justification? Well, we spoke just a moment ago about God's law. And we spoke about the fact that uh, we have all broken that law. And because we've broken that law, therefore we deserve God's wrath. Well, justification, it deals with that broken law. When God justifies a person, what's he doing? He's looking at that person and he's saying, they have not broken my law. He's looking at that person saying, they do not deserve punishment. That person is a law keeper. Now, how can that be the case? How is it that God can look at someone and say that? God's not a liar. We know that to be true. So how can he look at someone and say, they've not broken my law when quite clearly they have broken his law? How do we put all of that together? Well, we'll keep reading in Romans chapter 5 in verse 8. And we see in Romans 5 verse 8 and verse 9 that this justification, it was something which Christ achieved at the cross. Look at verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet law breakers, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified, there's that word again, justified, how? By his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. Justification through his blood. In one of his other letters, Paul drives home that point even more clearly when he writes that Christ made peace through the blood of his cross. That, that's where this deliverance from wrath comes from. That's where it was won. That is how you tonight can be justified. It was on the cross that Christ took sin onto his own shoulders and he endured the wrath of God as punishment for that sin which did not belong to him. Every believer, every Christian who's here tonight, you have been delivered from wrath because Christ was able. Christ was willing to endure that wrath for us. That's why it says in verse 8, he died for us. It's the heart of the gospel. Heart of the gospel. Christ's perfect and sinless life is put on everyone who believes in exchange for that person's sin. Christ, then at the cross, he endured the results of that sin which was put on him. And yet believers, they accept 
the rewards of Christ's obedience. That is how we are justified. That is how God can look at a lawbreaker and say, that person is a law keeper. They do not deserve to be punished. That is how you can be delivered from wrath. We start at the cross. And at the cross, we see deliverance from wrath. If we go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, we move from the cross, as we go to the middle of this verse, we now move to the tomb. And we see very clearly in that little middle section of the verse, the empty tomb of Christ, where we read of Christ, whom he raised from the dead. It's the resurrection of Christ. And while we have deliverance from wrath at the cross, now we have deliverance from death at the tomb. Deliverance from death. You'll notice, though, if you look carefully at that little phrase in verse 10, whom he raised from the dead, that phrase, it does not say that you or I are delivered from death. It simply does not say that. It only mentions Christ. And so, the obvious question you might be thinking is, well then, how is it that I can be delivered from death tonight by what happened that day at the garden tomb when Christ came alive? How can that mean anything for me tonight? How can that mean that I can be delivered from death? Well, this time I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And again, as before, go with me to 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to work our way through some of the verses in this chapter, in answer to that question. How is it that Christ being raised from the dead means that I will one day be delivered from death? How is that possible? In this chapter, Paul is going through a full discussion of the resurrection of Christ, and most importantly, what it means for everyone who believes in Christ. Look at verse 3 and verse 4. He set the scene. For I delivered unto you, first of all, That which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Paul is referring, quite clearly, to the central events of the Gospel. He's talking about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And he majors on the resurrection, as I've already said. He's really wanting to drive that point home in particular. You see that if you look at verse 17. He says, if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. That's a bold statement. A particular emphasis on the resurrection of Christ. He says it's absolutely essential. There is no such thing as a Christian faith. There is no forgiveness from sins tonight if we do not have a risen Savior who has defeated death. It's not possible. We're thinking about this question, aren't we? How does Christ's resurrection impact on his people? Why is it that when Christ defeated death, that somehow that means that I will defeat death if I'm a believer tonight? Look at verse 20. Read from verse 20 to 22. Paul answers that question in verse 17 where he says, If Christ isn't raised, then our faith is vain. Verse 20 he says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die. Even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. Now, verse 22 is the key to the question we're asking. We all enter this world in Adam. We all enter this world in him who is the first man. Adam sinned. Adam brought death into this world. And it wasn't just that that Adam sinned. But it's that every single one of us sinned with Adam in that garden. And so death has passed on all men. 
Every one of us. Because we all come from Adam. We all sinned in Adam. But Christ is altogether different. Verse 22 makes it clear. Christ does not bring death. Christ, on the other hand, in contradiction to Adam, Christ brings life. It says, all who are in Christ. What does that mean? All who are united to Christ, joined to him. All who have him as their head. What? They are made alive. Christ's resurrection is our resurrection. All who believe in him have been joined to him. And so his defeat of death 2,000 years ago is my defeat of death. What does that defeat of death look like? It's not that I will never die. You tonight, if you're a Christian, it does not mean that you will never die. Of course not. The key is in that word that we read, first fruits. Paul says it again in verse 23. He says, Every man in his own order. Christ, the firstfruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. What's Paul saying in that little verse? He's pointing out that Christ's resurrection from the dead is the pattern. The firstfruits. It's a pattern which all of his people will one day follow. He is a forerunner, a pattern. And so, if you flick over to verse 51, Paul then clearly makes the connection. Remember, we're, all this time we're thinking about this question. How is it that I will defeat death? Because we are joined to Christ. And so the outcome is verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. When Christ returns, his people, those who have faith in him and are united to him, they will be raised out of their graves in perfect, incorruptible, sinless, glorious bodies. That's why all the way through this chapter, Paul speaks about death, but he calls it sleep. That's why he speaks of death. Because, he says, or implies, death is not the end, it's a sleep. Every believer... Everyone who is laid into the ground during this life with tears, with great sorrow for the family, we know we must understand that one day that believer is coming back again. One day they will waken up from that sleep that they are under. Christ is the first. He is the one who set the pattern. And everyone who is joined to him by faith, one day they will follow after. So that is why we rejoice, those of us who are in Christ. We rejoice in the words of verse 54 and 55. We say, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? This is defeat of death and the grave. And every Christian tonight, you must acknowledge that it is yours only on the basis of what Christ has done. It's all because of him. Verse 57 says, Thanks be to God, which giveth us, giveth us the victory. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. He was raised from the dead. And in so doing, His followers are assured one day of that same experience in the future. And so, Christian, you and I ought to have a very different view of the grave tonight than the popular view of this world. Hebrews 2 and 15 tells us that God has, or Christ I should say, has delivered them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. 
See, Christ has delivered his people from death itself. He has also delivered them from fear of death. It has no lasting power. Death has lost its strength. Because of what we've been looking at here in 1 Corinthians 15, in light of the future, which is promised to all that are Christ, we no longer have that fear of death. It doesn't hold sway over the Christian. And yet tonight, for you who are still an unbeliever, you can identify with that fear of death. You can see tonight how that bondage can be applied to you. That's your experience. And let me be clear. You are right to be fearful of death. Absolutely reasonable to be afraid of death. If you do not have the hope, which I've shown to you tonight from 1 Corinthians 15, if you are not in Christ, it is perfectly reasonable for you to dread death. Because you will not have that victorious resurrection that the people of God will have, that Christ had at the tomb. There is deliverance from death. It is only for those who believe in Christ. If we go back to 1 Corinthians, or 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and read that verse 10 again. We come to the beginning of that verse. It begins with these words. And to wait for his son from heaven. To wait for his son from heaven. We started at the cross. And then we went to the tomb. And now we go forward to the future return of Christ. And in that, we see that the Christian has been delivered from a third thing. The Christian has deliverance from judgment. Deliverance from judgment. Paul is writing here to these Christians in Thessalonica. Uh, and as he writes to them in this 10th verse, he's pointing out that they're living on this earth waiting for the return of Christ, expectantly looking forward to his return. And Paul writes that because he knows that it's something that will encourage every Christian. In chapter 4, he comes back to that subject again. And after speaking about the return of Christ, he says in chapter 4, verse 18, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. He sees that the return of Christ is something that's worth looking forward to. It's something which we can Something which we should wait with a sense of hope. With a sense even of excitement for Christ to return. There is hope in this future event. Because as we've seen already, at that day, there's a resurrection in these perfect, sinless bodies for all of God's people. But more than that, there is a heavenly inheritance. Christ brings his perfect people to live in perfect peace and in perfect joy in his perfect presence forever. Perfect people in a perfect place forever. That is the heavenly inheritance. And so, no matter what is happening during this life on earth, no matter what pain you're feeling tonight, physical or emotional, no matter what loneliness you feel tonight, no matter even what depression you might be dealing with as you come to this meeting tonight, no matter what temptations circle around you every single day, Paul says, more importantly, God says, we can hold on to the future hope of Christ's return. He wrote in Romans 8, 18, I reckon... I've, I've weighed it up and I've come to the conclusion I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Not worthy to be compared. The return of Christ 
is wonderful for the Christian. It's the reason that we wait with this hope, wait with this expectation. But I must say tonight, it is the complete opposite for the unbeliever. It couldn't be more different. I think uh, of an example that each of us can identify with. Uh, as children, you might have, like me, waited expectantly for uh, your dad to come home from work, waiting all day, waiting for him to come home, just to maybe play with your dad as a child, or maybe he was bringing something home, a gift or a packet of sweets, or in our house on a Friday night, he was bringing home uh, the chippy. We were all going to enjoy our chippy on a Friday night, waiting, hopefully, expectantly for dad to come home. He's coming back with a reward, with a gift. But I know only too well from personal experience, that's not always what it was like. There were times when dad was coming home and I was absolutely dreading it. I'd done something I should not have done. I'd broken the car wing mirror. I'd scratched the side of the car, something, usually something involving the car. I knew I was going to be punished. I knew uh, that I'd have to own up to what I had done. Not feeling, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about in your, in your heart and you're dreading seeing him coming home again. I, you have to face the consequences for your actions. And that goes a very, very small way to illustrate the point. Two completely different responses to the arrival of the same person. Depends on the circumstances. And it is the same with Christ. His return is wonderful for some. It's brilliant. Because he comes, as we said, he comes with this everlasting reward. It's perfect. It's pure joy. And yet his return is dreadful for others. It's awful. Because he comes not with a reward. He comes as a judge. And he comes to punish. I mentioned earlier about that fear of death. A fear which tonight you are right to have if you are not in Christ. Joined to him by faith. And the reason for that fear is because of what will happen at his return. Because Christ He's returning to raise his people to glory and take them into their eternal inheritance. But at the same time, he is also coming to judge the world. He is coming to judge you. Look with me at John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verse 27. Christ here is speaking of himself in John 5 and 27, he says, speaking of the Father, the Father hath given him, that is Christ, authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. You see, in that 20, verse 28, it says all the graves will be opened in that day. And there's a resurrection in that day for everyone. Those who have not had their sin forgiven. It says that they are resurrected to damnation. Christ is coming back. And he has authority to execute judgment. He will be the judge of all the earth. And the stark reality is this. This is the bottom line tonight. Those who belong to Christ, they will be delivered and they will be perfected by him. And in the same day, those who do not belong to Christ will be judged and they will be damned by him. That wrath of God, which we've said already tonight, that you deserve for your sin, it will be all yours. 
If Christ did not suffer that wrath for you on the cross, well then you must suffer for it yourself in eternity. What will it be for you? Christ has not yet returned. You are not yet in your grave tonight. And so there is an opportunity for you and it is still open. There is deliverance from judgment. It's only for those who come to Christ. Remember, I said earlier that the gospel is a remedy for something. It's a remedy for sin. And I hope tonight it's been very clear to see that you need that remedy. You need to be delivered. Because the law of God, it stands broken tonight. Not by someone else. Not by Adam. Not by your parents. It stands broken by you. And therefore you need God's deliverance. You need deliverance from God's wrath. You'll find it in the blood of his cross. You need deliverance from death. And you'll find it at the empty tomb. You need deliverance from judgment. And you will find it by faith in the one who is coming back again for his people. This is a full deliverance. There's only one place to find it. So tonight, turn away from your sin. Turn away from whatever you're trying to do. Whatever scheme you might have dreamt up. Turn away from it. Put your faith in what Christ has done. He promises to forgive. God the Father, he promises to look at you and say, the law has been kept. You may receive the inheritance. That is a full deliverance. May the Spirit give grace tonight. May he enable you to come and give the gift of faith by the power of Christ. Let's turn to our closing hymn. Hymn number 230. 230. We'll sing just the first verse and the third verse. We'll leave out verse 2. 230. Chorus reads, Be in time, be in time, while the voice of Jesus calls you, be in time. And let's stand to sing uh, verse 1 and verse 3 of this hymn together now, please. give thanks tonight for that voice of warning a voice which bids us come to turn from sin to come to 
that fountain of living water. The only one who can cleanse from sin. Tonight, I pray that the Spirit would draw, enable those who have not yet believed, enable them to come. Enable them to believe, to turn away from sin. And according to the promise of Almighty God, they will be delivered from the wrath to come. Do it tonight, we pray. Do it for your own glory. And may Christ be praised in the salvation of the sinner. We ask it in his name and for his glory. Amen.